Well, welcome everyone. We are really, really excited to have everyone here for this wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Gassman, and I am a professor at Rutgers University, and I also have the uh, honor of being the director of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice, and we are sponsoring this wonderful event today. I want to introduce a couple really important people to you. We have Natalie Passa and Priscilla Pierre, who are both uh, working on tech. And as you can imagine, in our Zoom world, that's just a really, really important role to play. So I just want to say thank you from the outset uh, to both of them for, for their work. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Crystal Sanders, who is, uh, we chose to be the um, Proctor Distinguished Lecturer this year, and she will be giving a talk called The Forgotten Migration, The Black Struggle for Graduate Education in the Age of Jim Crow. And I want to tell you just a little bit about Crystal, and I'm going to go over her bio, but I did want to say that I have known Crystal for quite a few years at this point. And if you have not seen her, her give a talk, you are in for a treat because she is not only one of the strongest historians that I know um, in terms of uh, the craft of research that she uses, but she's also an incredible writer and she does an amazing job delivering the, um, the message to people. And so, uh, and that, you know, being able to do all three of those doesn't always happen. So I just want to give her a little bit of a shout out for um, always just um, doing such a wonderful job. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have her with us today. So just a little bit about Crystal. She's an associate professor of history and an award-winning historian. She's also the former director of the Africana Research Center at Pennsylvania State University. And her research and her teaching interests include African-American history, Black women's history, and the history of Black education. She is the author of A Chance for Change, Head Start and Mississippi's Freedom School Struggle, which was published by the University of North Carolina Press. And, um, and it was also part of the John Hope Franklin series in African-American history and culture. She, uh, her work can also be found in many of uh, history's leading journals. Um, and I would urge you to take a look at it. It's just really, really good work, uh, such as the Journal of Southern History, North Carolina Historical Review, and the Journal of African-American History. I'm really excited because she's currently writing a book about Black Southerners' efforts to secure graduate education. Uh, during the age of Jim Crow, and we are getting a bit of a preview today of this work. So um, that's a little bit about Crystal, and I just want to say welcome, Crystal. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm really excited, and it's the, the, the floor is yours. Oh, wow. Good afternoon. It is my absolute honor to participate in the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Lecture Series I'm very thankful to Professor Mary Beth Gassman for the invitation to present and for that very warm and generous introduction. Though not one of the Black Southerners that I write about in my forthcoming book, who received a segregation scholarship, a term that I will explain a little later, Dr. Proctor embodies the experiences and culture of aspiration that define the people I write about and will discuss today. After graduating from Virginia Union University, Dr. Proctor completed one year of graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania before transferring to Crozier Theological Seminary. It was common for Black Southerners to go North for graduate study during the era of legal segregation. For example, Carter G. Woodson, a son of Virginia, earned his bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Chicago before obtaining a doctoral degree in history from Harvard in 1912. Benjamin Mays, a South Carolina native, earned his MA from the University of Chicago in 1925 and his doctorate from that same institution in 1935. Thousands of Black Southerners went North because before 1936, there were only seven schools in the South, all private institutions where African-Americans could pursue graduate or professional school study. Those institutions were Howard University, Hampton Institute, Fisk University, 
Meharry Medical College, Gammon Theological Seminary, Atlanta University, and Xavier University. Graduate offerings at these institutions were limited. For example, graduate work at Hampton was only possible in education and the courses were offered only during the summer session. No black institution conferred the PhD degree until 1954. To be young, gifted and black with no opportunities to conduct advanced study in the regions of one's birth was a hardship that many knew well. Thus, leaving home in pursuit of graduate training was not new. What was new was leaving home with financial assistance from Southern state governments. Next slide, please. Except for a brief window during the late 19th century, when both the University of South Carolina and the University of Maryland admitted black students to their professional school programs, most Southern and border states denied African-Americans access to tax supported graduate education in the region until the 1950s or later. These states compelled black residents to go out of state for anything beyond the bachelor's degree, subjecting them to the indignities of traveling while black during the era of legal segregation, throwing them into Northern institutions that did not roll out the proverbial welcome mat for black Southerners, and separating them from their families for longer periods of time than required of white students who were able to remain in state for advanced study. I refer to the funds that states appropriated for black citizens graduate and professional school training as segregation scholarships, since the entire point of the tuition assistance was to preserve segregation. This educational arrangement was the brainchild of a black woman, of excuse me, of a black man, Walthall Moore, who was elected to the Missouri legislature in 1920. And you see a picture of Representative Moore on your screen. Moore's presence in the state house would set in motion a number of important educational changes for African-Americans, not only in Missouri, but throughout the entire South. Prior to Moore's election, Missouri rarely provided its black citizens the same educational opportunities as its white citizens, a practice that helped to preserve segregation and the racial caste system that limited African-American social, political, and economic trajectories. An Alabama transplant, it would be Moore who introduced out-of-state tuition grants for black college students and made advanced degrees a more realistic possibility for black Southerners. The grants, which were the first of their kind in the United States, allowed black students to study at black or white institutions that offered graduate study and served as a forerunner to the equalization strategies that black activists pursued to improve black education at the elementary and secondary school levels. Less than a month after taking office, Walthall Moore introduced a bill seeking $1 million to improve higher education for African-American residents in the state of Missouri. The state's sole college for African-Americans, Lincoln Institute, was a far cry in terms of funding, physical plant, and academic offerings from the well-funded flagship institution for white residents, the University of Missouri, commonly known as Mizzou. Moore's end goal, though, never realized was an upgraded Lincoln that gave African-Americans in Missouri the same opportunities that were available to white residents at the University of Missouri. He ensured, or he envisioned rather, state assistance for African-Americans to pursue post-baccalaureate study elsewhere as a temporary response to Missouri's higher educational neglect of its black citizens. Thus, segregation scholarships were not created with nefarious intent. Rather, they were a provisional arrangement to meet Black aspiration for advanced study out of state until the state's Black institution received the public investment necessary to meet Black needs. So what you see on the screen is a copy of the, the bill that Walthall Moore successfully introduced in the, Mississippi, the Missouri legislature in 1921. And if you look at section seven of that bill, it says may arrange for attendance at university of any adjacent state tuition fees. So essentially, until Lincoln was upgraded to be the equal of the University of Missouri, 
the state was to pay for black students to go to another state and receive the same opportunities and the same educational programs that were available in state to white students. Segregationists quickly embraced Walthall Moore's suggestion of exiling black students because it allowed them to delay questions about integration or educational equality. They found it more economical to outsource indefinitely the state's responsibility to educate African-Americans rather than build up the state's lone public black college. Next slide, please. What began in Missouri in 1921 soon spread to other Southern states. In subsequent years, all of the states that you see shaded in red on the screen started segregation scholarship programs. So you had West Virginia in 1927, Maryland in 1935, Oklahoma in 1935, Kentucky in 1936, Virginia in 1936, Tennessee in 1937, North Carolina in 1939, Texas in 1939, Arkansas in 1943, Alabama in 1945, Georgia in 1945, Florida in 1946, Louisiana and South Carolina also in 1946, and Mississippi in 1948. As you can see, the states with the largest Black populations were the last to create out-of-state funding for the graduate and professional education of Black citizens. The only Southern or border state that made no provision for graduate education for its Black residents was the state of Delaware. New slide. It is important to note that many states continued their scholarship programs until the early 1960s, defying the historic 6-2 decision in Gaines v. Canada, where the United States Supreme Court ruled in 1938 that states had a responsibility to offer white and black citizens the same education within their borders. The court gave border and Southern states three options to meet this constitutional obligation. They could one, discontinue graduate and professional school programs at historically white institutions, or two, desegregate graduate and professional school programs at historically white institutions, or three, establish separate but equal graduate and professional school programs at black institutions. The Gaines decision, which outlawed segregation scholarships, was the first successful legal challenge against the doctrine of separate but equal and paved the way for the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision. In response to gains, many states like North Carolina, um, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana established a few underfunded graduate and professional school programs at public black colleges. Missouri went so far as to discontinue its storied graduate journalism program at the University of Missouri rather than desegregate it. Most egregiously, states maintained, expanded, or even established segregation scholarship programs after gains. Southern recalcitrance in the educational arena proved the hollow victory of court orders without enforcement. And that's something I always tell my students. A court decision means nothing without enforcement. And even though the Gaines decision outlawed segregation scholarships in 1938, as you saw from the previous slide, many states thumbed their nose at the court and actually started exiling black scholars after this court decision was announced. As some of you may recall, even before Gaines, the NAACP had gone into court and began seeking educational equality in higher education. Their first victory, although it did not have national implications, came in Maryland in the case of Donald Murray, who wanted to attend the University of Maryland Law School. Maryland officials offered to pay for Murray to go to law school at Columbia, Harvard, or Howard, anywhere but at the University of Maryland, where Murray's tax dollars and the tax dollars of his family subsidized the education of non-Blacks. And I'm careful to say non-Blacks here because many of these universities, including the University of Maryland in 1936, admitted more than white students. 
there were students from China and Japan at the University of Maryland when Donald Murray applies for admission. In both a Maryland Circuit Court in 1935 and the Maryland Court of Appeals in 1936, justices ordered the University of Maryland to admit Donald Murray since Maryland only had one public law school and according to the constitution, that law school had to be available to all races. So the, the NAACP had gotten this victory in advance of gains, but Maryland did not take the case all the way to the Supreme Court, so there were no national implications. So that's why Gaines is held up as that first major victory on the road to Brown, because it was a case with national implications. Next slide, please. I've been hard pressed to find Northern institutions that didn't have some connection to segregation scholarships as these schools received Southern tax dollars year after year as Southern state, as segregation scholarship recipients, excuse me, flocked to all of the Northwestern institutions, Northeastern institutions, such as Harvard, Columbia, and NYU. We know they also formed critical masses at Midwestern and Western flagships, such as Chicago, Wisconsin, Ohio State, and Berkeley. In preparation for today's talk, I combed my records, searching for a Rutgers connection. But before sharing that connection, I have to provide the necessary background information. The state of North Carolina responded to the 1938 Gaines Supreme Court decision by creating a few graduate programs at two of its public black colleges, North Carolina College in Durham and North Carolina a and in Greensboro. North Carolina College, which I refer to as NCC, offered graduate study in the liberal arts and in law, while North Carolina a and offered graduate study in agriculture and in technology. In that first year, that graduate study was offered in the state of North Carolina at Black colleges, which was the year of 1939, 30 students enrolled in master's degree programs at NCC and five at North Carolina a and Faculty from the University of North Carolina and Duke taught these courses. Additionally, in that same year, 1939, the state instituted a segregation scholarship program to make up for the limited graduate offerings at NCC and a and Legislators in the Tar Heel State voted to provide its black citizens with advanced degree opportunities in March, 1939, and classes began in September. Students who desired graduate study that was unavailable at the two public black colleges became eligible for a segregation scholarship. James Shepard, the founder and president of North Carolina College was the main administrator of out-of-state tuition grants for black students in North Carolina. And he was the main administrator because he oversaw all, gra all um, graduate and professional study for black North Carolinians, excluding agriculture and technical disciplines. In the very first year that segregation scholarship funds are awarded in North Carolina, he gave out 49 scholarships um, that, were, that were available to students who had applied for aid through his office. And his counterpart at North Carolina a and President Ferdinand Bluford, awarded three scholarships that same year in agricultural and technical disciplines. Um, and I should tell you that the way this worked is that a North Carolina resident of African descent who could prove um, citizenship by church membership, voter registration, a birth certificate or tax records um, could present that evidence of citizenship and also provide proof of admission to a university. And after they did those two things, they became eligible for tuition assistance. And so applicants would submit an application to either Shepherd at NCC or to Blueford at A&T, and they could receive funding for an entire school year, for a summer session, or for both. In my records, not just in North Carolina, but across the South, the summer session option really catered to Black principals and school teachers who worked full-time during the school year. Shepard and Blueford would send tuition checks directly to the institutions where these students enrolled, um, the students only received money directly for their transportation costs. Typically, students were given bus fare or train fare, depending on what was the more economical route for them to get from their home towns to the cities where they were um, relocating for graduate study. And only if 
Pullman fare was necessary for overnight travel was a given, right? So, so a student wasn't just gonna get the best train fare possible, but was given the most economical one. And I should say that students only receive one round trip ticket, whether that was a bus ticket or a train ticket per academic year. And in that first academic year of 1939, 1940, when the state of North Carolina began graduate um, courses at NCC and a and NCC offered work, master's work in social science and science and mathematics and English education, while a and offered graduate courses in animal husbandry, industrial education, and agronomy. So if you were interested in pursuing graduate study, but in none of the disciplines that I just mentioned, you would have to apply for a segregation scholarship and then receive funds to study elsewhere. In that first academic year, North Carolina spent $9,700 sending black students um, to, to study out of state. No applicant received the full tuition amount and many of these scholars went out to study at some of the best institutions in the country, including Radcliffe, Atlanta University, New York University, and the University of Michigan. Eight black men in that first group of scholarship recipients received funds to pursue medical degrees at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. Next slide, please. Now the educational backgrounds and achievements of inaugural recipients of out-of-state tuition grants demonstrate the intellectual curiosity of black North Carolinians compelled to leave home. So you all might be wondering, when is she gonna get to the Rutgers connection? Well, here it is. Among the first black North Carolinians to receive state aid from the state of North Carolina was Charles Reginald Eason, who you see pictured on the screen. And Eason received funding to pursue a doctorate degree in mathematics at Ohio State University in 1939. Eason, born in 1905, was a native of Elizabeth, New Jersey. He moved to North Carolina in 1930 after becoming the first African-American to earn a graduate degree in mathematics at Rutgers University and the first recipient of a master's degree in math in Rutgers' reconstituted graduate math program. He taught math at Shaw University, the oldest black college in the South. After residing in Columbus, Ohio for several years while enrolled at Ohio State, Eason, for reasons that still remain unclear, left without completing his degree. One could speculate that Ohio State's racial climate might have been a factor in Eason's departure. Ohio State was not a hospitable place for African-Americans in the 1930s and 1940s. The school's athletic honor society, Bucket and Dipper, denied admission to Jesse Owens in 1936, even though Owens was the best athlete in Ohio State's history. White students wrote into Ohio State's campus newspaper, arguing that in a country governed by the Nordic race, it is impossible to put other races on parity with that race. Negroes should not be allowed to eat where we of the white race do, nor should they be allowed to use our schools. If one starts it, they all follow and soon take various places over completely. By 1937, bigotry at Ohio State led white students to establish a student organization called the Anti-Negro Guild that opposed integrated campus facilities. This was the environment that Charles Reginald Eason found himself subject to since the University of North Carolina was off limits to him and North Carolina's black schools did not offer any advanced study in his discipline. Next slide. While Eason did not complete his degree, thousands of other black Southerners did, persevering in spite of bigotry and educational inequality to reach their highest potential. Common challenges faced by segregation scholarship recipients included financial hardship and social ostracism. Raleigh native Elizabeth Young chose to pursue a Master of Science degree in physical education at Boston University during the 1939-1940 academic year. North Carolina gave Young $150 for tuition, $20 for fees, and $16.77 for railroad fare. Young, who aspired to teach physical education at the college level, 
assumed that the state would pay all of her tuition since she had no choice but to leave North Carolina to fulfill her career dream. Had she been white, she could have attended the University of North Carolina and received the same degree. Young expressed her disappointment about the funding gap in a letter to North Carolina College President James Shepard. In his response, Shepard reminded Young that Boston University charged $300 per year while the University of North Carolina charged $150 per year for the same course of study. The burden of making up the shortfall caused by segregation fell to Young. She made a way somehow and after graduating became a physical education instructor at several black colleges, including present day St. Augustine's University in Raleigh and Fayetteville State University in Fayetteville. When Alice Jackson, a segregation scholarship recipient, informed Virginia officials that the amount provided for her to pursue a master's degree at Columbia University only covered 20% of her expenses, officials told her to transfer to a cheaper institution. Most egregious of all were the number of aspiring Black scholars who applied for funds for graduate training only to be told that their states had run out of money for segregation scholarships. This was especially cruel and that these students and their families paid tax dollars that were used to subsidize the educations of white Southerners. In Alabama, demand for segregation scholarships always exceeded supply. Alabama began its segregation scholarship program in 1945 but there was a catch. Students had to pay their tuition fees up front and then submit receipts for reimbursement. Since most institutions in the North charged much more for tuition than the University of Alabama, the reimbursement requirement was an additional obstacle Black Alabamans had to overcome in pursuit of their educational goals. Alabama Officials turned away applicants annually because scholarship funds were always exhausted. In 1949, a committee appointed by Alabama Governor James Folsom to study Black education in the state recommended increasing segregation scholarships from 25,000 to 55,000 annually to meet the need. Unfortunately, the state legislature did not act on that recommendation keeping the funding um, limited to $25,000 a year, which was always exhausted before all applicants had received any funding. Fred Gray, who you see on the right side of your screen, was an Alabama segregation scholarship recipient who experienced the financial challenges of studying in the North. Gray grew up in Montgomery, Alabama and matriculated at the all black Alabama State Teachers College in 1947, where he joined Omega Psi Phi fraternity. Conversations with professors about civil rights led him to pursue law, foregoing his dreams of becoming a minister and teacher. Gray applied to several law schools outside of Alabama since the University of Alabama Law School was off limits to him. After graduating from Alabama State, in 1951, Gray entered Western Reserve University Law School, present day Case Western University School of Law in Cleveland, Ohio. One of the reasons why he chose that institution was because of the university's schedule of classes. Since law instruction was from 8.30 a.m. until 12.30 p.m., he still had time to work a full-time job and study. And I should add, that the study time was especially important to Gray because he had to not only learn Ohio's state statutes, but also Alabama's state statutes where he planned to return after graduating. Had he been able to study at the University of Alabama in the first place, he would not have been compelled to learn the statutes of two different states. Since Alabama did not provide tuition assistance up front, Gray applied for a loan at a local bank but was denied because he did not have sufficient security. He and his family borrowed money from friends and raised the funds to pay for his first term of law school. 
Money proved to be in short supply throughout Gray's law school tenure, but he managed to pay his fees, normally using the refund check he received from the state to pay his bill the following semester. He also worked part-time and received a scholarship from his fraternity. Gray graduated from law school in May, 1954. And after passing the Alabama bar, he set up at Montgomery Law Office that September. His office was one and a half blocks from the Montgomery Fair department store where Rosa Parks worked as a seamstress. The two became good friends and often discussed political matters over lunch. On December 1, 1955, Gray had lunch with Parks as he always did. That very evening, he learned that local police had arrested his friend for protesting segregation on a Montgomery City bus. He immediately went to Parks' home and agreed to represent her. At 24 years of age, Gray was thrust into the national spotlight for the first time, but it would not be the last. And attorney Gray at this point has had over half a century of success as a civil rights attorney going into various courts at the local, state, and federal levels, dismantling racism and white supremacy whenever he can. I oftentimes say that while we know the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house, Fred Gray and the law school education that he received at the expense of the state of Alabama certainly proves that we can weaken that house's foundation as he has done and continues to do even to this day. Um, new slide, please. In addition to financial hardships, many segregation scholarship recipients experienced racial hostility from fellow students and professors. Institutions such as the University of Kansas, the University of Iowa, and the University of Michigan barred Black students from living on campus. Kansas went so far as to mandate that Black students eat in a special section of the cafeteria because according to Kansas Chancellor Ernest Lindley, allowing black students to sit anywhere would cause white students to boycott the cafeteria. The color line led many black students to turn inward and toward each other when possible for social and academic support. And for many of the segregation scholarship recipients who I've been able to either interview or have found um, oral interviews that were conducted previously about their experiences at these northern historically white institutions, many of them talked about the importance of making friends with um, black families in the local community, the importance of black churches and the importance of black fraternities and sororities in providing a sense of fellowship, a sense of support and a sense of camaraderie in the midst of, of being in racially hostile institutions. And such was the case for Christine King, the older sister of civil rights activist, Martin Luther King Jr who traveled north for graduate school with her best friend. And Christine King Ferris wrote about the fact that when she went to Columbia, um, you know, she went with her best friend because she didn't expect people in New York to roll out the red carpet for her. She didn't expect her classmates to instantly develop any type of camaraderie or, or rapport toward her. And so often was the case that segregation scholarship recipients would either um, enroll in schools where they, they knew friends from back home, or they would enroll in schools where they had relatives located in that city to provide them with some type of um, social support as they are pursuing advanced study. So Christine King had finished Spelman College with a bachelor's degree in economics in 1948. And she wanted to attend the University of Georgia for graduate school, but segregation prevented her from doing so. Instead, she matriculated at Columbia University with a segregation scholarship in 1948. She quickly learned that Columbia was no promised land. Years later, she asserted that her first semester at the Ivy League institution was the worst time of her life. While the library was second to none and the campus was full of manicured lawns and perfectly placed trees, she found the classroom hostile. She entered as a graduate student in economics and was the only black student and the only female student in her classes. One of her professors, a white male, never acknowledged her raised hand or answered her questions. Despite being made to feel as if she did not belong, 
Christine persevered and received her master's degree in 1950. And I think the case of Christine King is interesting because not only does she matriculate at Columbia with her best friend, Juanita Sellers, but she talked about being a woman, being a black woman, traveling to the big city in the late 1940s um, during a time where it is not safe and not wise for young black women to be going so far from home and especially really on their own. And so when she just told her parents that she wanted to, to pursue graduate study at Columbia and they were really against it, having their daughter going to the big city alone, they made a, an agreement. And the agreement was that she would not really leave the vicinity of her campus unless her brother, Martin Luther King, who was studying in Philadelphia at the time, would come down and kind of serve as her chaperone and escort. So she talks about always begging um, Martin King to come to New York so that she and Juanita could go to the Empire State Building or, or go visit the Statue of Liberty because she did want to abide by the rules that she had agreed to with her parents. And so as a reminder for many of these, of these segregation scholarship recipients, but for Black women in particular, it is dangerous to be traveling and living in these foreign places. And oftentimes, um, you know, they, they felt compelled to either stay close to, to campus at all times or to have the support and the protection of a male friend or relative. Now, nearly 200 miles away from Christine King's Atlanta home was a young woman named Willarina Lamar, who was from Augusta, Georgia. When Wilhelmina Lamar graduated from high school in 1948, she dreamed of studying biology at the University of Georgia. But of course, Georgia's segregation laws compelled her to go to the all black Talladega College in Alabama instead. Georgia's public black colleges did not offer a biology major, which is why she went out of state for her undergraduate education. Lamar excelled academically at Talladega and graduated with honors in 1952. She submitted an application to Western Reserve University, present day Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio for graduate study because she had an aunt who lived in the city. And I should say that Lamar and Gray were at Western Reserve University at the same time and knew one another because most of these Southern students um, would hang out informally after hours, would attend the same churches and would find the same um, restaurants to eat at because there weren't many restaurants that would serve Black students or Black patrons. While Talladega had more than prepared Lamar academically, she was in a very different world socially at Western Reserve. She went from a school of 400 to one of 10,000. She studied with people from all over the world. The other two women in her master's cohort studying biology were from Panama and Poland. Despite having to commute to campus because black students were not allowed to live on campus and work, Lamar made good grades. Decades after graduating, she recounted the racial sting of being denied membership in Sigma Chi despite her high marks. Sigma Chi, an honor society for scientists, extended membership by invitation only from other members. None of the faculty at Western Reserve nominated her despite her stellar academic performance. And this slight was something she talked about decades after receiving her degree. She told her, her children about this. Several of her professors were members of this honor society and could have easily nominated her for membership as they nominated other people in the graduate program. But she was denied that honor. And that was a, a slight that stayed with her um, really until her death. Next slide. Stories of racism abound among segregation scholarship recipients. The renowned historian John Hope Franklin received a segregation scholarship from the state of Oklahoma during the 1935-1936 academic year to pursue his doctorate at Harvard. So on the screen, in the very bottom of the screen near that red arrow, you'll see where it says that John Hope Franklin received $25. And this was for the 1935-1936 academic year. The Oklahoma Board of Education actually did payments in, on, on a quarterly terms. So in that year, he received $100 total toward his doctoral study at Harvard. 
Franklin found Harvard to be a socially challenging place for black students. He later recalled, and I quote, a day and often an hour didn't go by without my feeling the color of my skin and the reactions of white Cambridge, the behavior of my fellow students, the attitudes real and imagined struck by my professors, end quote. Racial slights at the Ivy League institution were not simply perceived. In a class where John Hope Franklin was the only black student, he endured the professor telling a darky joke without shame. As scholars have pointed out, historical narratives of the great migration have tended to obscure the entrenched realities of Northern racism. And let me just say here, when I tell people about this project, they often say, well, yeah, but these students got to go to much better schools than the schools that were in their home state. So they'll say Harvard is 10 times better than the University of Oklahoma. Columbia is 10 times better than the University of Georgia. And while that might have been true for many of these students, they did not see this as a, as a grand gift from their home state government because they are being made to leave home. They are being made to, to, to get on highways and, and roads and travel, travel back roads at a time where traveling while black is truly dangerous, where it can be humiliating where there could be no public bathrooms for hundreds of miles for um, Black patrons to use. So we oftentimes have to think about the fact that even though perhaps they're going to some of the best institutions in the world, there are a lot of negative um, consequences to this arrangement, especially the way that these institutions, the faculty and the staff in particular, the way that they treated Black students, meant that this was not a walk in the park. This was not a, 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 you know, a paradise for Black applicants who are simply hoping to reach their highest potential. Next slide. What you see on the screen are just, and you probably can't read it, but what you see are just a sampling of the types of newspaper articles that one can find in Black newspapers from the 1920s to the 1960s announcing um, how much funding Southern states are providing for um, Black graduate education during that period. Segregation scholarships were big business in the South as white legislators did not care about the humiliation and exclusion that Black Southerners endured. From 1929 until 1935, a six year period, Missouri appropriated nearly $56,000 for segregation scholarships. If we adjust that amount for inflation in 2020, that's $1 million. So $1 million spent in a six year period to exile black scholars to the North and West. And we must remember, Missouri would continue these segregation um, scholarships for another 15 years. I just gave you a six year figure. At one point, the state of Florida was spending $75,000 annually to send black students out of state. The money expended was really in a situation where the states are robbing Peter to pay Paul. By this, I mean that every dollar spent to export black students was a dollar the state could have used to improve the physical plant and to expand the academic offerings of public black colleges. The state of Kentucky went so far as to deduct the amount of segregation scholarships from the annual budget of the Black Public College, Kentucky State College. So we know that segregation scholarships are, are hurting the bottom line of these Black colleges who are losing money. Money that could have been invested in them is being sent to states for other states to take on the responsibility that Southern states refuse to, to um, acknowledge. The crucial funds needed for laboratories, libraries, and better trained faculty, what we would call the accoutrements of graduate education, went into the coffers of institutions outside of Southern states. Think about that. Mississippi, Georgia, Louisiana, Tennessee, Virginia, Missouri, they are all sending tax dollars to institutions in other parts of the country because they don't really believe or support Black education. They're willing to send money outside externally rather than invest in public black colleges at home. When the state of North Carolina inaugurated graduate study at NCC and NCANT in 1939, it authorized a pharmacy school at NCC, at North Carolina College. 
North Carolina never got that pharmacy school. During the 1949-1950 academic year, North Carolina sent 15 Black pharmacy students out of state. These numbers are small, but demonstrate demand. And it is highly likely that a pharmacy program would have drawn significant numbers of students from other states. So while North Carolina every year is paying for pharmacy students to go out of state, they could have created a pharmacy program at North Carolina College in Durham if they wanted to. That pharmacy school would have attracted black students from across the country, but they chose not to do so. Instead, they continued to pay for black students to go north and west to receive the very training that could have been provided in North Carolina. A year before he died, NCC President James Shepard wrote to North Carolina Governor Cherry inquiring about the possibility of setting up a medical department at North Carolina College. He understood that Black Southerners' limited opportunities to pursue medicine in the region had a detrimental effect on Black health care. During the 1953-1954 academic year, North Carolina paid for 17 Black medical students to study at Meharry and Howard. There's no question that establishing a pharmacy school and a medical school at a Black college in North Carolina would have dramatically improved Black access to professional health care. It also would have created more opportunities for Black students across the country to have access to Black medical education. Remember that Walthall Moore, the architect of segregation scholarships, envisioned them as a temporary measure until Lincoln became the Black equivalent of the University of Missouri. Though his bill became law in 1921, as late as 1938, Lincoln did not have one single graduate program, although lawmakers found the financial resources to send Black Missourians elsewhere, doing so until 1950, when the University of Missouri began admitting Black students. Next slide, please. When I talk about this system of robbing Peter to pay Paul, some point to the handful of graduate and professional school programs that were created in the 1930s and 1940s at public black colleges to, su to suggest that state legislatures did not completely neglect these institutions. When people make that argument to me, I counter that most of these programs were initially nothing more than an attempt to evade the spirit of the Gaines decision. To quote scholar Lewis Macmillan, these graduate programs were born of conflict and not of long range planning. Born of conflict and not of long range planning. Seven Southern states, Missouri, North Carolina, Florida, South Carolina, Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, set up makeshift law schools to feign the existence of separate but equal. Take, for instance, the case of Lincoln University School of Law that Missouri authorized in June 1939 and opened in September 1939. The school is conceived in June, and three months later, it's open. Do you think the University of Missouri Law School was built that quickly, an overnight makeshift institution? The state of Missouri leased space in a building that was also occupied by a pool room and a movie theater. So a little background, Lincoln University is located in Jefferson City, which is not too far from the capital of Columbia. The Lincoln School of Law is put in St. Louis, hours away, and it's really put in St. Louis for two reasons. That was the city with the largest black population, but there was also a building there where the university could easily and quickly rent space for this law school because the state was not gonna build a new building. So they rent space in a building that also houses a pool room and a movie theater. It shows you just the type of investment and the real care and concern that lawmakers had with giving black students a law school that was equivalent to the one at the University of Missouri. The Lincoln University Law School had 13,000 volumes as compared to its white counterpart, which had 35,000 volumes. Lincoln's law librarian had no legal training. And I should just add here that Charles Hamilton Houston and the NAACP 
were all ready to go back into court and prove that the Lincoln University School of Law was not the equivalent of the University of Missouri Law School. They took depositions from all of the faculty and administrators at Lincoln School of Law, and they also took depositions from faculty and administrators at the University of Missouri Law School. This effort to go back into court and prove that separate was not equal was foiled when Lloyd Gaines went missing. The story of the Lincoln School of Law is a story that we could say we see time and again across the South. In Oklahoma, officials created a makeshift law school at Langston University in a mere five days. In Texas, lawmakers created something called the Prairie View Law School, which was to open in February 1947 in response to a lawsuit brought by Heman Sweat. Even white officials could not pretend that the Prairie View Law School was equal to the one at the University of Texas, and that one official described the law school as a suite in an office building in downtown Houston. The suite consisted of two, possibly three rooms with new furniture and office equipment. The Dean of the University of Texas Law School had furnished approximately 400 basic law reference books chosen from a list required for the education of first year law students. When not a single black student applied to the overnight law school, state officials accused the NAACP of encouraging African-Americans to boycott the institution rather than admit that the entire operation was an insult to black Texans who wanted no part of the sham. Next slide, please. Through this project, I hope to expand what we know about opposition to Black education and fully acknowledge the labyrinth of schemes used to prevent Black women and men from obtaining master's, doctorate, and professional degrees. I also hope that this work causes Southern state governments and flagship institutions to consider how they can begin repairing the harm that they caused to large numbers of Black Southerners who paid taxes to outfit and upkeep graduate programs that were closed to them. There are untold numbers of African-Americans who did not reach their highest potential because they had no desire to leave the region of their birth. As I researched these segregation scholarships, I've also found countless numbers of letters from black students who are writing to registrars and writing to college presidents saying, I don't want the aid. If I can't go to the school that's in state, I will not be able to pursue graduate study for various reasons, whether it was family obligations, health challenges, or so forth, many people could not just pick up and go elsewhere. And so for many of these African-Americans, they were not able to pursue the graduate training that they desired. Additionally, I hope with this project that Southern state governments will begin to consider um, the debt that is owed to state-supported Black colleges for the decades underfunding and curricular underdevelopment. The practice of compelling Black students to leave home to secure the same opportunities provided to white students locally should be understood as a form of racism, just as pernicious and evil as racial violence. We teach our students about lynching. We teach our students about disfranchisement. We teach our students about segregation. And these segregation scholarships maintained white supremacy and suggested there was something so peculiar, insulting and wrong with black people that required them to be educated elsewhere. That's why it's important that we acknowledge this, that we acknowledge this in the same way that we acknowledge the ways in which um, Southern state governments fought against desegregation at the elementary and secondary um, education levels, right? This was, a, this was really a form of racism that we still have not reckoned with. And I hope that through this project and the work of others, we will begin to have those conversations and begin to figure out how to repair harm. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Crystal. That was wonderful. I'm giving you some applause here because I know it's weird when you give a talk on Zoom and you can't hear people. But um, I just wanted to, um, we're gonna do some, uh, some Q and A with you. So, um, and uh, we have uh, lots of great questions coming in. So please put them in the chat. 
Um, so uh, our first question, uh, this one is, um, uh, oh my gosh, lots and lots of questions coming in. So um, here's the first one. Um, I think this, I'm trying to see if this is more of a statement. I'm just gonna um, read it. Fascinating, excellent presentation. Thank you um, to Professor Sanders for making the small but significant connection to Rutgers. She says, my daughter started at North Carolina A&T, but we are both Rutgers alums. Although I well remember hearing my parents, aunts and uncles tell of the struggles of attaining their undergraduate and graduate degrees up north as South Carolina residents, these histories must be known and acknowledged, lest we all forget how and why uh, racism is so systemic and pervasive. I do hope my grandson will one day graduate from Meharry. So mm -hmm. I, it's not a question, but do you want to comment or anything on that one? I mean, I'll just say doing this project shows you the connections. You know, I first became interested in this when I learned that church members that I knew who were from rural North Carolina were getting master's degrees at Columbia and NYU in the 1950s. And that made me begin to ask questions. Well, why didn't they just go to a and or why didn't they go to Elizabeth City? And so I began to see that not only, um, you know, not only were, were Black Southerners barred from white institutions that were offering graduate study, but that these Black colleges oftentimes did not have any type of graduate programs that were available. And so because of that, we do see networks. You do see lots of Black Southerners who have some connection to Northern and Western institutions. All right, thank you. Okay, here's the question. And this one, I think, um, sort of links to uh, Adam Harris's book, The State Must Provide, which just came out. And the, um, the person says, is it true that even today, the HBC land grant universities receive less than they should as compared to the white universities? And I know that um, uh, I, I know this isn't like 100% directly related to what you were talking about today, but you alluded to it. So I'm hoping you'll be able to talk for a minute about that. So it is true in certain states. We must remember that each state can set how they divvy up their, their land grant um, allocation that they receive from the federal government. So in certain states, yes, indeed, the black land grant still is not funded at an equitable level um, to the white land grant. That's part of the reason in the state of Tennessee, just um, what, 2020, there was a huge settlement. And that was to begin to address those years of systemic underfunding. So yes, that is true. And Adam Harris's book is wonderful. It's a wonderful book. Again, I'm trying to join that conversation to understand how institutions can begin repairing the harm that has been done you know, for generations to black institutions. So here's a question too. It's because um, I, I loved how you ended by talking about how, um, you know, how it's time for this conversation, right? About how you repair this harm and and um, you know, in, in my own research, quite a few times I've noted that you know, if um, one way uh, to provide reparations to African Americans is to fund black colleges, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, one thing that I wanted to to ask, and and one of the questions talks about is um, wh wh what, like, how would you have that conversation with these institutions, and how do you think um, your work could move them to um, to actually taking some action? Because it's you know, it's a lot of people respond by saying, well, that was in the past, right? And they don't want to take responsibility, but it's a pretty recent past, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so how would you, how, 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 what arguments can you make like to be really compelling and convincing? Well, first I will say that archives are a historian's best friend and archives are also um, an attorney's best friend. We even think about the Brown case. They work closely with historians to provide the documentation of underfunding. And in that same regard, with respect to um, Black colleges today, there is much evidence in the archives that shows systemic underfunding by the state of its public Black colleges. And, and that's, that goes for across the South, whether we're talking North Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Virginia, Tennessee, whichever state you want to pick. So I think one of the first things is to use records, use government records to show underfunding and use government records to show how in several instances where the state had the opportunity to do one thing, they chose to do another. And the thing that they chose to do created harm. 
So if we're going to talk about a form of, um, you know, of reparations for Black colleges, we have to start with curricular development. And we have to start with how do we make these institutions continue to be viable, continue to be strong, and continue to have strong enrollment. That gets to what types of courses these institutions are able to offer. Again, I oftentimes say, you can go back to when most um, Southern states are beginning to desegregate higher education and see what the federal government advised these states to do. In the 1970s, when most Southern states are pursuing desegregation at the higher education level, they are in consultation with what was then called the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the Department of Hugh. And time and again, in state after state, Hugh essentially says, you will be able to achieve desegregation and to strengthen your Black colleges by putting academic programs at them that are either not offered at the white college or that are closed at the white college and put at the Black college. So taking North Carolina, for instance, it is Hugh that tells the UNC system, close the nursing school at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. There are nursing programs at A&T, Winston-Salem State. We don't need three nursing programs in the triad. State officials chose to ignore that advice. Later in the 1970s, when North Carolina decides that it needs a vet school, the only vet school that we have in the state, and it was decided that it made sense to put a vet school at a land grant institution in North Carolina, like most states, has two land grants, the white NC State and the black NC a &T. Again, it made perfect sense. Put this vet school at a &T. It creates an academic program that would be um, complete completely unusual, right? The only one in the state. But lawmakers, once again, chose to put that vet school at NC State University. So I would say when you're beginning to have these conversations with state officials about correcting harm that's been caused, this isn't something that's on emotion. This isn't something that we're making up or pulling out of thin air. The evidence is there. And so you present that evidence and you say, you know, for, for years, We've um, state officials have gone one route, but it's now time to go another route. So that means that we're going to be creating new graduate programs, or we're going to be creating new um, professional school programs. Those programs should be going to Black colleges because those programs are going to bring research dollars. They're going to bring new buildings. They're going to bring new labs, new libraries, new faculty, and it's going to bring students. And so that's one of the, the ways in which I think um, Southern states can begin to remedy um, the century of harm that they have caused to public black colleges. Thank you, thank you. So we have a whole bunch of questions in here and I just want people to know, I'm gonna to try to get to all the questions and I know that um, Crystal, I'm sure would love to answer them all. So here's another one. Did the types of schools impact the rollout of openly admitting or financially sponsoring black students? For example, did general graduate programs admit before law or medical schools? No, I don't, if I'm understanding the question correctly, no, it's not that you would see a program admit a master's student or a school admit a master's student before they admitted a professional school student. And so first we must remember that black students have been going to these graduate programs in the North for years, since the late 19th century. What was new was going with state assistance, right? And so, and again, most of these states um, are going to welcome those those tax dollars. They're going to welcome that guaranteed tuition check that's coming or partial tuition check. Um, so I, I've never seen where one state or one institution started first by admitting students to a master's program and then built up to admitting students to a doctorate program or a professional school program, if that's answering right. you. I think if yeah, I'm answering your question great. correctly. And we have to remember, so this isn't new, right? We know that Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson. If we, if you're a Georgian, you might remember John Wesley Dobbs, but John Wesley Dobbs' daughter, Josephine, she goes to Columbia in the 30s. Um, th it wasn't new in the early 30s. It wasn't new for Black students to be pursuing these, um, you know, these advanced degrees. It's just new that Southern states began to take some initiative to say, we provide for our, our uh, Black citizens even if it was a very perverse system. All right, thank you. Um, you did have like a little cheering on comment here that I just wanna share. 
said yes, when we learn and know this history, it serves to strengthen African American scholars resolve to pursue, persist, and succeed. So just wanted you to know that. Um, here's another question. Um, and there are actually two questions related to medical schools. One of them was um, related to, could, could you provide a few more examples related to medical education? And the other one says, um, will you speak on the Flexner report and its impact on black medical education? So maybe a longer answer kind of looking at both of those. So for those of you who don't know, the Flexner report was a report written by um, Abraham Flexner. It was commissioned by the American Medical Association in about 1910, 1911. And essentially he was to inspect and rate all medical schools in the United States and Canada. And the, the, the on the surface point was supposedly the, the standardization and professionalization of medical school education. But in reality, what it did was decimate black medical education. Because at that time, um, you know, there were several black medical schools, including the Leonard School of Medicine at Shaw University in North Carolina. And after um, Flexner's report is released, he essentially says there are only two black medical schools in the country worthy of support and worthy of funding. And those two schools were Meharry and Howard. So after that report comes out, um, the General Education Board, people like John Rockefeller, people like um, Peabody, stop giving funds to black medical schools other than Meharry and Howard. And that leads to the closing of these schools. So by, 19, by 1918, when Leonard in North Carolina closes, there are only two black medical schools in the entire country. Those two medical schools being um, Howard and Meharry. So what does this mean when we know that Northern schools or, or historically white medical schools have quotas where they're only admitting one or two black students in each incoming class, or sometimes in a four year, in a, a two year or four year cohort. So what that means is that there are lots of African Americans who were denied the opportunity to study medicine because there is no place for them. You know, every year Howard and Meharry are turning away hundreds of applicants because there is simply no room. In, in um, at one point, I believe it's in the 19, it's like in 1948, the ratio of black physicians to black Southerners is one black physician for, um, for every 6,200 black Southerners. That has a very negative effect on black health outcomes as African-Americans are denied access to, um, you know, standardized professional health care because there are no black doctors to treat them. So I mentioned that to say, you know, states, decide that they're gonna, uh, you know, so for, for most Southern states, medical school was always on the table. You know, sometimes dentistry was not a funded discipline, but medical school was because most of these Southern states understood that they needed black doctors. And so we take the case of North Carolina, North Carolina um, from, from 1939, from the inaugural year of segregation scholarships, it did award money for citizens to go North and West to study medicine. One of the people I write about in the book is Dr. Hubert Eaton, a black man who um, pursues his medical degree at the University of Michigan. He receives his degree in 1942. He then has a very long and successful practice um, in Wilmington, North Carolina as a physician. Uh, there are countless stories of African-American doctors. I'm, the one, there's a, a famous doctor in Alabama whose name is escaping me right now but he uses um, segregation funds from the state of Alabama to go to Meharry. He also comes home and opens up a medical practice in his hometown outside of Birmingham. So we definitely know that medical school education was essential because of the dearth of opportunities for black students to actually um, pursue medical training. I'll say that at one point, um, and I talk about this in the book, at length, at one point, Southern states formed this um, conglomerate, I'll call it, that was, that was championing regional education. So as a way of, of feigning compliance with the, the Gaines decision, there was gonna be this regional education where all Southern states could essentially pull their resources and say, we've created a medical school or we've created a dental school for black Southerners. And so, 
um, this regional education with respect to medical education was supposed to be at Meharry. Meharry was having financial difficulties. Meharry's white administrators uh, made overtures to Southern state governors to say, we will allow this regional education, this network of Southern states to take over Meharry because that would guarantee funding for Meharry. And in exchange, um, every state would have a certain number of slots guaranteed. So if North Carolina um, you know, paid into this pot to support Meharry, then every year 10 slots of a Meharry's incoming medical class would be reserved for um, black students from North Carolina and the same with other universities, or excuse me, with other Southern states. And this deal only falls through because Meharry's black alumni rally and say, no way, no how, are we gonna help Southern states to get out of their responsibility of providing equal education for black citizens? So it's really, it's, it's really a, a, an extraordinary story that such a renowned and storied institution, the Harry Medical College at one time could be bought and be bought by segregationists at that. So I talk about it more in the book, but it gets to this whole point of again, Southern states looking for a back door rather than just invest in public black colleges. So trying to take over Meharry was gonna be a backdoor way of saying that black students had equal access to medical education. Thank you, thank you. Um, so here's a question that is um, not completely about your talk today, but more about just the craft of history and just um, asking, um, what was your motivation for becoming a historian and doing this kind of work that focuses on education? Oh, wow. Such a good question. So when I tell people this answer, either people think it's beautiful or they think I'm crazy. But when I was probably 12 or 13, my grandmother gave me a brick, a, a real brick, a clay colored brick. And I remember telling my parents, I think grandma's going crazy. I don't know why she gave me this brick, but it was a brick from her high school, the Johnson County Training School, which she had graduated as salutatorian of in 1945. And as was the case with so many black schools after desegregation, county officials decided to tear down the school. And when the school, my grandmother was a nurse, and when the school was being torn down, she took off work went to the side of the school and got some bricks. She took some bricks as kind of a way for her to memorialize this institution that had meant so much to her. And for me, you know, as, as a teenage girl, I really wasn't interested in, in these bricks that much. But as I got older, I began to try to reckon with the idea that this school could mean so much to my grandmother, but in my history books, everything I'm taught about Black schools prior to desegregation was negative, right? We were taught they were underfunded. We were taught that there were these dismal schools, yet that wasn't the recollection that my grandmother had of her institution. And she loved it so much that she took bricks from the site. So that made me wanna try to reconcile these two competing narratives about black education prior to desegregation. So I wrote my, um, well, first I wrote my college essays, my admission essays about this brick but then when I got to college, I did my undergraduate honors thesis on this high school. And so that kind of fueled my love of the history of black education. And I said, okay, this is something I really enjoy. I wanna continue writing about it. So when I got to graduate school, I actually wrote about black college activism in the 1930s. And I thought that was gonna be my dissertation topic until I came across something on, um, U.S. Senator John Stennis opposing Head Start as a front for communism. And I remember thinking, what could be so bad about Head Start? How is it a front for communism? How is he railing against early childhood education? And that led me to my dissertation topic, which became my first book. And um, since then, I've just always been interested in the history of Black education. So that's kind of how um, I've, I've gotten into this particular field of study. All right, thank you. Um, people love the story. Very <laughs> powerful. You recently, I had this wonderful opportunity to interview Crystal for a book that I'm writing in. So she told me that story, <laughs> and I love that story. It's absolutely wonderful. I hope that it appears somewhere in one of your books because it's a beautiful story. Um, okay, so here's a couple more questions. 
Um, first, did segregation scholarships favor certain areas of study in addition to medicine? So were there some that were valued over others? There weren't areas that were valued over others, but the rules in all of these states were that you could only get a segregation scholarship if the state did not offer that area of study. So let's take North Carolina. In 1939, when North Carolina started its graduate programs, in addition to those master's programs, it did open the law school, but the law school was only open for one week because of low enrollment. The law school reopened in 1940. So from 1940 onward, if you were a North Carolina resident of African descent who wanted to study law, you had to go to North Carolina College's law school. North Carolina would not pay for you to go study law at Howard or at um, Columbia or at, or at um, Harvard, right? So that's really, there wasn't that, that certain disciplines were, um, you know, were, were more highly respected or were, were funded at a higher rate. It simply had to be a program that did not exist at the public black college. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is a really interesting question. Um, the person says, I currently work in a North Carolina predominantly white institutions graduate program and my non-black counterparts have often asked, how do we support black students? And the list feels overwhelming at times as the students struggle financially, academically and socially. What would you say are the first two things that my non-Black colleagues could do? Okay, well, well, first, and this, this might be off the table because it sounds like you already have the Black students, but I oftentimes encourage schools to recruit at Black colleges, right? So when you are recruiting for, um, you know, graduate programs, don't just go to, to the schools that you know about. Don't just go to the schools where your faculty have graduated from but make a special effort to recruit at black colleges. So after you recruit those students, right? After hopefully you have, um, you know, wined and dined them and, 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 and had them to select your institution for matriculation, the point is retaining them. And so retaining them requires a number of features. First of all, no student should be made to go to a school and not see anyone who looks like him or her. So that means that hopefully your institution has a diverse faculty and staff also, your, your cohorts, it shouldn't be that students are thrust into a situation where they are the only graduate student there who looks like them. So that means ensuring that students have that form of community by having students of various races and cohorts. Additionally, I say, you know, find the funding, find the funding to ensure that these students who oftentimes could be the first in their family to go to college, oftentimes could be studying away from home for the very first time in their lives, have the resources they need to be successful. So that may be creating special scholarship programs that recognize and that fund first-generation students, that fund students from historically underrepresented backgrounds. So you're ensuring that if there's a gap there, right, a gap financially, that gap is covered so that the student can focus on his or her academics and not be concerned with the bottom line, not be concerned with being able to pay rent and pay tuition. So funding is key, diversity is key, um, speaking up when that student comes to you with a problem. I remember I'm very grateful. I actually had a situation that was racial in graduate school and I had a great advisor who spoke, who when I came to her and shared my concerns, she didn't dismiss them. She didn't tell me to um, just keep my head down, but she addressed the situation head on. And so that means being a good advocate and a good mentor for students when they come to you and share concerns, even if those concerns um, you didn't recognize them. You are, are shocked that they're occurring. It helps for students to know that they are heard, that they are seen, that they are believed, and that other people will go to bat for them. Other people will advocate for them. And so for that to happen, you also have to um, be approachable. Students should know that you're going to be a safe person on campus. You're going to be a person they can confide in. You're a person that they can talk to. You're someone they can go to when they have questions, when they are feeling as if um, they don't belong, right? When they're dealing with what we call the, um, you know, the imposter syndrome, whatever it is, you want to make sure that they have places and people on campus that they can go to for community and go to for reassurance. So those are just a few of the things that one can do. 
Thank you so much for all those ideas. There are tons and tons of things that you said. So hopefully, you know, everybody who's listening uh, jotted those down. So important. Um, okay, so here's a question. Um, were there arrangements between specific northern schools and southern sa states so that the money funneled only went to those specific northern schools? I haven't found cases of specific arrangements other than, you know, there was a time where Meharry did have an arrangement with Southern states. Um, typically though, what would happen is that students would go where they knew other students had been. So if a lot of black teachers go to Columbia and NYU, and they do that because they know of other black teachers, their colleagues who've already gone through those programs, who can give them tips about which professors to take, which professors to stay away from, tips about where to live, where to get a job to make ends meet while you're there. So if there was any type of um, pattern of students going certain places, it was because students themselves talked and networked. And a lot of times students would go where they had heard of someone else going. Um, they were going where they knew of someone being there that could help them, that could actually um, you know, provide community, provide housing, provide advice. So that's typically the, the pattern we see. All right, so I have another one that's not necessarily related to your talk, but more about your um, professional role. Um, and they're asking, who are your role models? Who do you look up to? Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, there's so many. Now, first, people would say it's cliche because I'm going to say Mary Beth Gaspin, but I'm not oh, going to say that because she's on the call. <laughs> Mary Beth didn't tell you how we actually met. Oh. So, so I will tell you that story. She's the first person I'll name. And really quickly, the way we met is, you know, I'm a North Carolina native. Uh, my parents both went to public colleges, public black colleges in North Carolina. So I have a, a, a soft spot in my heart for North Carolina's five public HBCUs. And it was, I don't even remember what year this was, maybe 2011, 2012, 2013, I can't remember. But the legislature had a proposal on the table to close Elizabeth City State University, a public black college in the northeastern part of North Carolina because of low enrollment. And I was horrified because I knew the history of that institution. I knew the long history of underfunding of that institution. And I knew that in many ways, places like Elizabeth City State had been underfunded in order to overfund places like the University of North Carolina. But here I was low on the totem pole. I felt like who's going to listen to me to try to explain why this is such a bad proposal. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, I've got to sound the alarm. I've got to ring the bell. I got to call some famous people and ask them to make a statement. I literally sitting in front of my computer just started Googling people. I Googled Mary Beth Gassman, who at that time was at the University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, you know, all professors' phone numbers are online. I literally just picked up the phone and called her and she answered the phone. And I said, you don't know me, but, but I don't know if you've heard that the North Carolina legislature is trying to close Elizabeth City State University. I need people that can make some noise and can speak to this issue. And so she was like, okay. You know, she, she was like, yes, I, I think you told me you had heard and, and you had been even been maybe been contacted by some outlets. But number one, she picked up the phone, right? She didn't just say, I don't, I don't, I don't recognize this number. She listened to my whole diatribe. She didn't say, I'm too busy. I have other things going on. And she did make public statements in support of that institution. So I admire people who are not just well known in the academy, but people who can back up their notoriety with actual support, right? Who can back it up by actually doing something, using their platform and using their voice for a greater good. So that's one person. Another person who happens to also be a Rutgers professor is Erica Dunbar, Erica Armstrong Dunbar, who's a historian. Yeah. And the reason, like Mary Beth, she picks up the phone, right? And she'll pick up the phone for anyone, a student, a colleague, a faculty member, the woman down the street. She picks up the phone and she will give sound advice. She will help you however and whenever possible. And I, that to me has been instructive. It's a reminder that no matter how big we get in the academy, because she is an endowed chair. She actually just signed a seven book deal with Simon and Schuster yesterday. She is still accessible. And she still understands that to do this work that we do, right? The work of reclaiming black history and of bearing witness to black resiliency is something that means you can't turn your nose up at the, the person who might 
have received no education, but has a story who needs to be heard. And you can't not pick up the phone when someone that you barely know calls and has a very compelling and um, you know, urgent need that they think you might be able to solve or you might be able to address in some way. So Mary Beth, Erica are two. Um, my, uh, when I was an undergrad, Dr. Ray Gavins was someone who believed in me when I did not believe in myself. When I told him I'm interested in these black high schools, he didn't say this has already been done. He didn't say, I really don't see the point, but he said, let's make this happen. He was someone who as my undergraduate advisor, one time called me at 1 a.m. in the morning to tell me what was wrong with my thesis. At the time, I was really mad. I was like, how dare he call me at 1 a.m.? I got things to do. It's my senior year. But looking back on it, I see that he had invested so much time and he wanted my thesis to be just right, that he was willing in the middle of the night to let me know, I've got to make some changes and reprint it again before morning because for for me to be my best self and to present my best work required me to work around the clock. And that type of work ethic is something that I've tried to replicate as I've since entered the academy myself. So he's someone else who I greatly admire, I'm greatly thankful for. He passed away in 2016 and his absence is sorely felt. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, we are at the end of our um, time with Crystal. I did, I, I, what a lovely way to end because mm -hmm. I, and thank you for that nice shout out. Um, but um, it's, you know, I, I do think like it's so important to, um, to, uh, and I'm glad you've experienced people who answered the call and who, um, you know, actually really take these issues seriously. It's just so, so important. Thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. There were so many wonderful comments in the chat about the talk. It, I think it's so timely right now, and you're definitely the person to be doing this work. So um, thank you for spending time with us. We really, really enjoyed it. And um, thank you to our tech team, and thank you to everybody who hung out with us today. We really appreciate you and please uh, keep track of the Proctor Institute. We have lots and lots of good stuff happening. So um, we'd love for you to join us. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you.